How many of you had your breakfast today? All right, well, I hope you've still got room for more because we have a four-course feast uh, served up by our humble but illustrious pastoral staff here, so you're in for a treat. But first, you have to listen to me. Uh, well, actually, I'm the, I'm the guy who's setting the table and then serving up the first dish. I'm the appetizer. I, I'm like the cheese stick of the pastoral staff. Hey, I'm a little crunchy and hard on the outside, but soft and warm on the inside. Or to use a sports analogy, I'm the leadoff hitter, the, the uh, first leg of the relay. Or how many of you have seen like a, a, a tag team wrestling match, WWE or something like that? All right, we're not out of a tag team uh, match today. We have a tag team message. Now, some of you might like to see that. How many of you'd like to see me and Jeff uh, take on uh, these young guns, Pastor Austin and, and uh, Pastor August? Now, I was a high school wrestler, as I'm sure you guys have probably figured out at some, some point by now. So when Pastor Austin comes at me in just a bit, I might be tempted to hoist him up into airplane spin and toss him into the first row before I tag off to Pastor Jeff to, to finish him off. But I'm not going to, I'm going to refrain from that. Why? Because as much as Bob would like to see that, I know, uh, that's not how we behave in the sanctuary, all right? But more importantly, these guys are not my opponents. They're my colleagues. We're on the same team. All of us who uh, are part of this thing called the church, who identify with and follow Christ, uh, we're in this together. And we need to realize that that, that means more than just coming here and, and showing up on Sunday. That's a good thing. And that needs to happen. The Bible says uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as, as some do, but we need to come together to encourage each other even more as we see that, that day approaching. So uh, we got together the other day as a, as a pastoral team. And at this time of year, we're looking to kind of see what to emphasize as we uh, come out of a busy summer and into the time of year when everything's coming back together. And the last few years, it's been show up September. Now, how many remember the show up September? That's gone well for us, but we wanted to freshen it up just a bit. And so we were talking. We couldn't really land on any kind of a promotional theme. We kept coming back instead to, to more of our overall purpose and who we are as a church and, and what we need to build on for here. And we kind of honed in on four words that really describe uh, who we are and where we need to be in the days ahead. And those are the words that outline this message today. And they are these. As a church, we need to connect, grow, serve, and go. That summarizes why we exist as a church. We need to uh, help people connect with God and with each other. We need to uh, grow in our relationship with God and each other. We need to serve God as we serve each other. And eventually, we need to go out alongside each other to bring the message of Christ to a lost and dying world who's desperately searching for that purpose. And we believe that that is our purpose this morning. And the first thing we need to do is we need to connect. Nothing's going to happen unless we as a church realize that we're all in this together. Now, I'm not going to break into the theme high school musical. Some of you may still be trying to get that out of your mind of the pastoral staff doing that a few years ago. I have, I have you know I had no part in that. They didn't include me in it. But we need to connect. And that means more than just showing up on Sunday. That connection implies a deeper relationship. It implies an investment in each other's lives and understanding that to accomplish anything of significance, we need to be in unity. And Jesus understood that, and he made it clear in the prayer he prayed for his followers the night before he was betrayed. Now, how many of you know that if you, like Jesus, knew that, that these were your last hours, that the things you share with your loved ones around you would be the things you consider most important. So I want to look at what Jesus says and how he prays in John chapter 17. And he says this, I'm going to begin reading verse number 9, and you're going to help me out with this. Uh, but he says, I pray for them, I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and the glory has come to me through them. Uh, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be as we are. Okay, now he goes on to pray for those who would uh, come after him, and that includes us. My prayer is not for them alone. But I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, 
that all of them may be Father, just as you and me, and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me that they may be as you and I are, I in them and you in me, so that they may brought, be brought to complete unity. For then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved me, even though as you, as you have loved me. Now, uh, you catch a common theme in there? Jesus wants his, his followers to be unified. He wants them to be as one. He wants them to come together. You know who doesn't want us to come together? Satan wants us to be divided. He wants us to be disconnected. He wants us to be isolated on our own, trying to live out our faith by ourselves. That's why one of his most common uh, uh, schemes is to convince Christians that, that church participation is optional. That you can just take it or leave it. You're just as, just as well without it. Now, uh, if Mark, you invited me over to your house just to spend some time with your family, and uh, we acted like we were good friends, but I just kind of made excuses why I couldn't come and, I, and this and that, and you kept coming to me and said, hey, I need you to come over sometime. I say, well, just, just text me or call me. That isn't really necessary. At some point, uh, you're probably gonna say, dude, what, what is it? I mean, uh, I keep asking, you never wanna come over. I invite you, what, what's the deal? What if I were to say, well, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of like to, but, uh, but it's Judy. I really, I just can't, uh, I just, uh, man, I, you know, she just gets on my nerves. I'm sorry. How do you think that's going to go over at the Snowden house? I know how it would go over at the Huffman household. That's, but that's essentially what we're saying uh, to Jesus when we say, hey, I'm okay with you, but, but just not the church. And as pious as that may sound, I'm not sure Jesus appreciates that attitude because how does the Bible refer to Jesus in relationship to the church? It calls it his bride. So when people are basically saying, I'm okay with Jesus, but they snub his bride, the church. You know, I mean, church people may get on your nerves sometimes, right? They get on mine, let's just be real. All right, and Pastor Weaver just probably got on yours and mine uh, from time to time. But that's no reason we can skip out. Thank the Lord that he's more patient with us than we are with other people. Now, I'm preaching to the choir here. You're already here. You want to take part, but that connectedness implies a deeper relationship. It implies an investment in each other's lives, and that's why Jesus prayed that we be one as he and his Father are one. Now, I want to pick up just a little bit further in Acts chapter 2. This is after uh, the believers are following Jesus' command and they were waiting for what he said would be power from on high. And in Acts chapter 2 verse 1, it says that when the day of Pentecost had come, do we have it there? All right, well, you probably remember. It says that they were in one place and in one accord. Okay, there you see the thing again. He wants his followers to be together. And, and, and that day, what happened? It says that, what, that after that, that, that uh, suddenly there came a sound from heaven, the rushing mighty wind and filled the whole place, and the Holy Spirit fell, and 3,000 came into the church that day because they had heard the truth, they saw the unity of the believers, and then they witnessed the power that came as a result. But that unity and that power, that atmosphere of vitality in the early church only came about because they were of one heart and one mind, and they were in it together. Now, what does that unity look like? Skip down a little bit further to Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 42. It says this. This is how it all happened. It says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. All right, that was teaching about Jesus. It's what we have in the Word now, Old and New Testament. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. That's coming together in this place and in other places. The breaking of bread, that's sharing in each other's, in the everyday things of life, sharing meals, and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to one another as everybody had need. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Acts chapter four kind of summarizes it like this. All the believers were in 
one heart and mind. No one claimed any had possessions of their own, but they shared and shared alike. And because of all that they did, at the end of that, look what it says. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in who? In all of them. That was the atmosphere of miracles. And how many of you know if signs and wonders uh, were happening, if, if literally uh, God initiated miracles and people were coming to him on a daily basis, uh, how many of us can agree that that would be a church on fire? That would be a church in, in revival, a church fulfilling its purpose. But the atmosphere of that vitality, of that oneness, was, was a unity and an investment in each other's lives. And that's what Jesus wants for us today. Because only when we come together, only when we're connected, can we fulfill our purpose. And that's what the things on this table have in common. Only when they're connected can they fulfill their purpose. This pipe here is not really a pipe. It's just a tube by itself. Things can pass in it, they go out of it, they don't get anywhere. Or things come in it and leak out of it that aren't supposed to. But when it's connected, it can become a conduit for all kinds of vital things. Water, fuel. This appliance here is just a wire with a big hunk of metal and plastic on the end of it. It can't draw power, it can't deliver power on its own. But when it's plugged in, it becomes a useful tool. Now, not for me, because I don't iron anything, but for somebody, it's useful. <laughs> These bricks may be solid, stable on their own, just like a lot of us can appear solid on our own, but unless they're joined together, they just make a pile of rubble. But when they're laid one on the other, they become a magnificent structure. Even this flower here, as beautiful as it is, and Pastor Luke mentioned this a few weeks ago, that it can stay alive for a little while in water, but as soon as it's disconnected, it's starting to die. And the same goes for the church. Just because we gather here at the same time and place on a Sunday doesn't accomplish anything in the long run. Putting up a building is not gonna fulfill our purpose because the church is not concrete and steel. The Bible says Jesus would build his church, but he's not talking brick on brick. He's talking person to person, joined, connected, invested in each other's lives because that oneness is more than just coming together on a Sunday. It's investing in each other's lives. It's being connected with a common purpose. It's sharing time together and being in each other's homes, sharing our stuff if need be. And when we come in here, it's not just about ourselves. We're here to make sure that somebody else benefits from that time. You're going to hear a lot in the days ahead. Connect somewhere, serve somewhere. Find a, a, a class or a place where you're getting involved and taking in and growing spiritually, but then also find a serve team where you're able to give out and do something for the benefit of others because that's when we're fulfilling our purpose. That's when we grow individually and as a church, and that's what Pastor Austin is coming to talk about that's next. That's right. Thank you, Pastor Kerry. So we believe that to grow best is when we connect, and so... Here at New Hope, we are fortunate to have a, many different avenues, many different ways that you can grow in your faith. And I'm gonna give you three reasons in a little while about why it's important to grow in your faith. But before we do that, congratulations, you have all made it to Austin's Glorious Game Show, where everybody's a winner, because it's 2021, okay? We get to um, play a game, and I'm gonna ask six questions biblical related questions and you guys are going to answer them in your head dad not out loud dad you answer these in your own head keep track of your own score where the points don't matter um, but this is not made up this is this is good stuff so going through this we're going to start out pretty easy how many books are there in the bible i'm going to give you five seconds how many books are in the Bible? I hear some whispering, some chattering, some cheating. Okay, 66 books are in the Bible, okay? I think many of you are still survived. Question number one, we're gonna go a lot more difficult this next one. You gotta really put on your thinking cap, okay? From the time it started raining to the time that the earth was dry, how many days did Moses spend on the ark? Okay, from the time that it started raining until the time the earth was dry. How many days did Moses spend on the ark? Trick question! Moses wasn't on the ark. Noah was on the ark. All right. Some of you guys still don't get that. All right. 
Question number three, who is the father of Seth, or who is his daddy, right? Who was Seth's father in the Bible? Yes, Steve. <laughs> he goes, I am. No. Five, four, three, two, one. The answer to that question was Adam, the first man that God ever created. See, Seth is often uh, lost in the, the limelight of his murderous brother, Cain and Abel, right? So we forget about Seth. All right, fourth question, who was Phoebe? Now, I know you guys have some uh, sitcom friends, uh, uh, excuse me, sitcom fans with the TV show Friends. Julie, I know that that's one of your favorite, but Phoebe is not in the Bible from Friends. Phoebe was a deacon of the first century church in Centuria. Question number five, how many of you guys are just like, this hurts my brain, you need to stop, right? How many are like, go on, I'm learning stuff. This is fantastic. All right, question number five. Which commandment includes a promise? One of the Ten Commandments includes a promise. Does anybody know that? Does anybody know what number that it was listed? Number five, just like the number of this question. It is honor your father and mother. Children, you better listen up. It's the only one that comes with a promise. Comes with a promise. All right, last question. We'll see how you guys are doing. Some of you look like you're treading water. You could come up from air right now. What was the name of Abraham's first son? Abraham's first son, because we know all the song, right? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. And his first son was Ishmael, right? Because Sarah said, go sleep with Hagar, our hand servant. And he listened to his wife, which was a bad plan right? Um, and he had Ishmael before. Wait, did I just say that listening to your wife is a bad plan? Oh boy, Lord help me. Jesus help me right now. God help me. All right. Well, I hope that you guys had fun on my glorious game show. And here's why we are all winners. If you got one or more incorrect, congratulations. You qualify for attending Sunday school because you need to learn more about the Bible, right? And if you happen to get all six correct, then you are more than qualified to teach Sunday school. And Pastor Kerry will stalk you immediately following the service. Okay, all joking aside, it is so important important for you and your family to grow in the understanding of God's word and what it has to say. And today, I'm only going to give you three quick reasons. The first reason that it's important to grow in your faith is that faith comes from the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God. I don't know about you, but every time I read the Bible and I read the promises that are described in the Bible and then I watch them be fulfilled throughout all of history, it gives me confidence and it builds my faith that God and all the promises he has for me will be fulfilled. I, I don't know about you, but when I read about the gospel and the good news and the work of the cross and how God loves us and his love is ever enduring, it, it builds my belief, it builds my faith, and I can believe that God does love me and it speaks to my doubts and it speaks to my fears. Do you struggle with overcoming um, or, or believing, excuse me, do you struggle with believing what Christ has spoken over you and your family? If so, it's time to dig a little bit deeper. It's time to join a class. It's time to get in the word of God. The second reason why uh, growing is important and growing in the word of God is that we overcome Satan by the word of God. Psalms 119, 11, many of you learned this as a child. I have hidden your word in my that I might not sin against you, right? We see Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew chapter four, overcome temptation from Satan, and what does he do? He sings a melody, right? Wrong. He says, it is written, it is written, it is written, and three times he overcomes the tempter by quoting the word of God, and it's confirmed. In Ephesians 6, verse 17, it instructs us to take on the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Do you struggle with overcoming the sin in your life? Then start by digging into the word of God. Join a class. The last reason is to stand firm until the end. Psalm 1 through 3 says, Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his 
law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. See, the Bible is very clear that in the last days, doctrine will be twisted and people will be led astray by false teachings and things will seem to be right, but there's actually a manipulation of scripture and many people will fall away to these false teachers. Second Timothy 4 verses 3 and 4 says, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to miss. Parents, do your children know the word of God well enough to identify when there is false doctrine being presented to them? Because there are a lot of things in today's culture that gets presented, and at surface level it sounds, wow, that sounds really good. But there is a way that seems right to man, but it leads to destruction. It's time parents that we get our kids back into Sunday school, back into the routine of Wednesday nights, and we begin to disciple them. Parents, it is time that you get in. Individual, aunt, uncle, whatever you are, get into a class so that we can stand firm until the end of time. Years ago, the American Banking Association had a training program where it would bring in hundreds of bank tellers in order to try to teach them to identify counterfeit money. Now the interesting thing is during this two week training process, not once did those bank tellers touch counterfeit money. Only the original bills passed through those uh, tellers' hands. And the ABA believed so much that if a teller was super familiar with the original that no matter how close a counterfeit was, they would be able to identify it as a fake bill and, and be able to, to identify that. Do you struggle, church, with identifying the truth? Would you be able to identify a counterfeit gospel if presented with one? It's time we get plugged in. It's time that we grow deeper. It's time we understand and know why we believe what we believe. It's time that we grow. And as we grow as a church, as you grow as a family, there's only one proper response to that. And Pastor Jeff's going to share on that. Thanks, Pastor Austin. So as we share our life together with other believers and as we grow in our knowledge and understanding of the Lord and his word, the natural response is to put our faith into action, and we do that by serving one another. Did you know that the phrase one another is found a hundred times in the New Testament? Those commands are primarily about unity, about love, and about humility. That's how we're to relate to one another as the body of Christ. The human body is absolutely incredible. Did you know that the average human heart will pump over 1,000 gallons in one day? In your lifetime, your heart will pump 55 million gallons. Your heart hasn't stopped beating since you were born, it never sleeps. And by the time you are finished on this earth, your heart will beat approximately two and a half billion times. And never once did you take a moment to think about, am I making my heart beat? Your lungs contain a thousand miles of capillaries which your body uses to turn oxygen into carbon dioxide. The DNA in your body which contains your genetic code, if it's stretched out, it will reach to the sun and back, that's 93 million miles one way, 61 times to the sun and back. Your brain contains between 100 and 500 trillion synapses, and I'm not gonna take time to explain that, but if you will just um, think about how powerful our brains are, they're more powerful than the greatest supercomputer. So all these different parts of the body that God has created, designed by him to work together in unity, and the Bible teaches us that the human body is the very fitting illustration of the church, the body of Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. All the different parts of our body work together in perfect unity. And this is God's plan for his church. Each believer working together in unity with one another, together with God's help, we can do amazing things. Listen, our human nature tends to think mainly about ourselves. We don't think about other people naturally. 
We're all self-centered to some degree, but God wants to help us to overcome our thinking only about ourselves so that we can grow by serving one another. Paul said in Ephesians 4.16, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Unity in the body of Christ leads to the growth of each person and it leads to a healthy church. Serving others is similar to a workout program for your body. We all know what happens if we don't exercise regularly, right? Our body grows weaker and it doesn't function efficiently and it's the same if we neglect serving one another. So exercise by serving and you grow spiritually and the church will be stronger. From its inception, New Hope has been a church that actively demonstrates what serving one another is all about. It's one of the hallmarks of our church. It's one of the first things that I noticed when I came to visit to interview almost 24 years ago. So I wanna take a moment to ask everyone who is here in the, in the room, uh, who serves either on a weekly or a monthly uh, basis in some ministry you're serving in our church. I'd like to take a moment just to ask you to stand. If you serve in early childhood, children's ministry, youth, cleaning, lawn care, don't let me, don't wait till I say your, your ministry. You just serve sometime uh, during the week, all right? Go ahead, so we had some people who didn't even stand, oh, stand and remain standing. I'm looking around and seeing this. Here's the deal. It takes all of us working together. In most churches, 80% of what's done is done by 20% of the people. But look around and see who, who is serving here. You guys can be seated. Let me just say thank you on uh, behalf of our staff and the whole church for you serving and giving. Would you just take a moment to, to appreciate those people who serve? We are who we are because you give your time to love and to serve people. But the reality is we could all do something. COVID has caused a little bit of a hiccup and put a pause on some of our ministries, uh, but the reality is, is we're moving forward. Our best days are still ahead of us. We can say the best is yet to come. As believers in a world that is going crazy, we can say our best is still ahead of us because we know, we know what's at the end. And so we're gonna continue working so that more people would know. So think about this. If everybody was serving somewhere, there would be more than enough help. It would make the load lighter. It would make it easier. And there's so much more that we can do. And so with all of us exercising our serving muscles, we're stronger and more mature as a church. This morning when you walked in, you should have received a bulletin and you have a, a serving brochure, places to serve at New Hope. I want you to take time uh, this morning to take, take a moment to look through that, pray about, seek the Lord about where it is that I can plug in, where do I fit in here? And some of those, I get it, they're, they're, they're talents. To play in the orchestra, to, to sing in the choir, it takes some gifting that way. But most of what we have uh, it doesn't take a gift it's just giving your time to say I'm gonna serve in this way sitting in a in in the early childhood hugging and holding babies is an incredible thing that anybody can do my wife and I do that on the fourth Sunday night service we do that and I love doing that and there's so many things that you can do whatever it might be I want to I ask you to consider a couple of things uh, Anna has a pastor Anna has a, a say yes booth out there if you can serve I mean just think if I'm not doing anything that's something you can do we have prayer teams and uh, of all different kinds but on Sunday mornings when we pray for people we're looking for teams of people we we've done that through COVID we've kind of uh, not not had that happening as much but we want to build that up and the first impressions, parking lot ministry. The last couple of weeks, I've had several people say, hey, the parking lot's full today. We have go golf carts that will bring people from farther parts of our, our parking lot and bring them in. So we need people to drive those carts, people to direct traffic. Just some ways that you can plug in right away. But listen, pray about it. What we would love to see as a church, for our church to be the healthiest it can be, is for 100% participation. We're all serving in some way. But serving isn't just about what happens inside the walls of this church. There's a lot of opportunities around for us to carry the light of Jesus to serve our communities and ultimately the world. So not only do we connect and grow and serve, but we also go, Pastor August. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. You guys enjoying this morning so far? Come on, it's good. Well, I am, uh, I'm August, not Austin. 
okay? Austin's the weaver, August is the Hoffman, okay? And I'm Hoffman, not Huffman, right? Pastor Kerry's the Huffman, I'm the Hoffman, all right? Man, we're going to solve this problem one day, I believe it, I believe it. But as a follower of Jesus, we've been called to be double-minded in one aspect of life, and that is to get more of Jesus and give more of Jesus, okay? We're supposed to be, you know, single-minded. The Bible tells us don't be double-minded. You can't serve two masters. You can't, you got to be dedicated. You got to be of one mind, of one accord. But in one way, Jesus is telling us you need to be double-minded. You need to get more of me. You need to have a relationship with me, and then you need to give me away. Get more of Jesus. Give more of of Jesus. And so as we grow spiritually in our relationship with Jesus and we connect with other believers and serve the church, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to fill us up, move us closer to him. And that, my friends, is a very necessary part of our walk as followers of Jesus. We can't forsake our relationship with Jesus to do other things, right? We can't sacrifice our time with Jesus to go and serve the church because if we sacrifice our relationship with Jesus, we can't can't serve the church. We can't serve each other. We People have tried that. I know I used to try that. I would sacrifice my time with Jesus and I would try to serve and then I would get burnt out and upset and angry. Well, it's not the church's fault. It's my fault because I sacrificed my time with Jesus. We can't sacrifice our time with Jesus. We need a relationship with Jesus. We need to grow deeper. We need to be in the word of God. You recognize that uh, John 1.1 1, 1 says, uh, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. That means that every time you open up the word of God, you're allowing Jesus into your life. We need that. It's necessary. But another part of our relationship with Jesus that we cannot forsake is to reach lost people. It's just as necessary and just as important as filling ourselves up. We have to be believers who walk out of these walls, go into the world, go into our communities and shine bright the light of Jesus in the darkest places and reach lost, broken and dying people with the hope that we have found in Jesus Christ. That is our mandate, that's what we've been called to do. And if we get really good at growing ourselves, but we don't reach out to the lost, we are missing out on Jesus's commission to all believers for all time. What that means is you are forsaking your purpose as a follower of Jesus if you do not reach lost people. If you choose to sit here on Sundays and, and receive the word and grow and, and consume, 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 but you choose not to reach out to lost and broken and dying people, you are forsaking the purpose on why you were created and why you're here right now. Because Jesus says, I created you to be in relationship with me and part of that relationship is to reach lost people. Recognize this morning that James chapter one, verse 22, says this, don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. I don't know about you, but I love the book of James. It's very strong. It's like a punch to the face or a wrestling match that Pastor Kerry apparently wants to get in with me and Pastor Austin. Let's go. But I love the book of James. It's strong. It hits you in the face. It doesn't pull any punches, kind of like our own James. Right, Pastor Weaver? I just wanted to say his first name on stage because I never get to say it. But James Bray, he, he tells us, you're only fooling, you're a fool if you think that you can just listen and consume and not do anything with it. You're a fool. You're, you're, you're forsaking your purpose. You're not doing what Jesus has called us to do. We have to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. And so what does that mean? That means that we listen when Jesus tells us, go into all the nations, preach the gospel, tell my story, give away the hope that you have found in me and make disciples of every person you come in contact with. That is a command that all of us have been called to do, to fulfill. That is our mission, that is our vision as believers in Jesus, as followers of him. And so my final question for you this morning is this. Will you go to where lost people are? Will you go to where lost people are? And will you give to the people who are going to the places that you cannot? Will you give to the people who are going to the places that you cannot? The DNA of this church the DNA of New Hope Assembly of God, 
is to reach lost people right here in our community and all around the world. That's why we are setting records in missions giving and, and we support over 100 missionaries around the world because we believe, we believe that we need to reach lost people. We believe that we have the, the light of Jesus inside of us and we have to shine it bright all across the world. But let's be honest. Let's be honest with ourselves for a moment. Dropping money and writing a check and dropping it in the, in the giving boxes is a lot easier, a lot easier than literally stepping out of our own comfort zone into a neighborhood where there's brokenness, where there's darkness, where there's people who need to hear about Jesus. We've been called to go. And friends, recognize that New Hope is not just a name of a building. New Hope is who we are. We are people who have found new hope in Jesus Christ, and therefore we will be people who carry that hope to other people who need to find new hope in Jesus Christ. Because hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. And if we are going to be believers in Jesus, we need to be people who will reach out to lost and broken and dying people. We need to be people who will not only connect and grow and serve, but we will go to where lost and broken and dying people are. I know I sound like a broken record saying the same thing over and over and over again, but friends, if we do not get this into our hearts, if it does not go from our brain to our hearts, we are doing what James has told us we're doing and fooling ourselves. We cannot be fools that contain knowledge of Christ, but do not do what he has called us to do. Let's not be foolish, friends, let's be the church. We as a church, we support parachurch ministries right here in our own backyards, and they're shining bright the light of Jesus. Organizations like Freedom for Youth, Teen Challenge, the Des Moines Dream Center, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Hope Ministries. We have opportunities right here in our own community to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Pastor Brett, you can come. Church, we cannot just be hearers of the word, but we have to be doers of the word. Because if we are the people sitting here in this room, in this moment that says, I believe in Jesus. I have a relationship with Jesus. I will connect, I will grow, I will serve. Then we also have to be people that say, I will go. I will do what you have called me to do. I will reach out to the people you have called me to reach out to, because if not us, then who? If not us, then who? I don't know if you've know this, if you've not recognized this, but this world is broken. Our world is broken. And there are people out there that believe there is no hope. There are people out there that believe they have no purpose to be alive. There are people out there who are living without the love of their creator. There are people out there who bear the image of Christ who don't even know it. And so if we're not the ones who are showing them hope, if we are not the ones who are showing them Jesus, then who is going to? And if not now, then when? If not right now, then when? This is a perfect moment, a perfect opportunity to rise up and be the church and be the people that we've called to be, to carry the truth and the light out into this world and into our nation. And so this morning, what are you going to do? What are you individuals sitting here today, from the oldest person to the youngest person in this room, what are you going to do? All of us have something we can do. And I believe that if you fail to plan, you're plan planning to fail. So for the next few moments that we have together, I'm gonna stop talking and I want you to take uh, whatever you're using to take notes this morning. If that's a bulletin, if that's the notes app on your phone, if that's your Bible or a notebook that you brought with you, I want you to pray for the next few moments and write down what your next step is. How can you connect? How can you grow? How can you serve and how can you go? I believe that Jesus has deposited things in your mind as we were talking this morning about ways that you can do all of this, ways that you can fulfill the mission. And so look through that pamphlet that you got, that handout that you received that has all of our serving areas. Maybe consider getting into a Sunday school class next week or a ministry, a midweek ministry on Wednesday night. And I believe that each and every one of us here right now encounters, has somebody in our life that we will encounter this week who needs to know about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And so as we take the next few moments to pray, 
as we take the next few moments, I want you to write down their name who it is that you are going to, who it is that you're gonna share the love of Jesus with. And maybe as you write down their name, write down a way that you can get connected and and continue to serve in this church. Maybe I'll challenge you with this. If you've never been on a short-term mission trip, your next step, your action point today is to go get connected with the Copels out there. Begin to pray for our missionaries that we support. And then say, God, I don't know where it is. I don't know when it is, but I am going to go because I've never stepped out of my comfort zone in a short-term missions way. So God, I am going to go wherever it is, whenever it is, and then begin to prepare for that. Friends, all of us, if you have blood in your veins and breath in your lungs, all of us can do something and we have something to do. We believe that the best is yet to come a move of God like we haven't seen, lost friends and family members coming to faith in Jesus, healing and miracles breaking out in our workplaces and in our community centers, not just in this room. But friends, we have to be the ones to rise up. We have to be the ones to carry Jesus into this world. So what are you going to do? God is calling all of us somewhere. He's showing us a way that we can get connected, a way that we can grow, a way that we can serve, and a way that we can go. Will you follow him? Will you do what he's asking you to do? Will you reach the lost? Will you spread the hope? Will you commit to growing deeper in your faith? Will you connect with the body of believers around you? Will you serve this church and this community? Friends, we believe the best is yet to come. We believe that God has what's best for your life. All you gotta do is follow him into it.